स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया In the last lecture, we laid the topological framework to state Cauchy's theorem. Cauchy's theorem basically sta states that if f is a holomorphic function, then the integral of f over a rectifiable curve is homotopy invariant. Let me write down the statement. Cauchy's theorem. Let's work on an open subset omega of C. Let omega contained in C be open and f from omega to C be holomorphic on omega. If gamma 0 from AB to omega and gamma 1 from CD to omega there are two rectifiable curves. Say they are rectifiable from rectifiable curves from Z0 to Z1. We are imposing the condition that both gamma 0 and gamma 1 have the same initial point Z0 and the same terminal point Z1. And that they are uh, and that they are rectifiable curves. And such that gamma 0 is homotopic with fixed endpoints to a reparameterization of gamma 1. And suppose gamma 0 is homotopic to a reparameterization of gamma 1, then the integral of f over gamma 0, this is the same as the integral of f over gamma 1. This is what it means to say that the integral of f is homotopy invariant. We go from one curve to another curve to which uh, the given curve is homotopic with fixed endpoints, then the integral is going to be preserved. Not just about uh, homotopy with fixed endpoints. This is the case with uh, homotopy as closed curves as well. So, let me write that down as well. If gamma 0 from a b to omega and gamma 1 from c d to omega are closed rectifiable curves. Such that gamma 0 is homotopic as closed curves to a reparameterization of gamma 1. Of gamma 1, then the integral of f over gamma 0 is the same as the integral of f over the Cauchy's theorem is a very powerful tool in the sense that uh, it can be used to compute the integral of f over any rectifiable curve by shifting the, uh, the curve via uh, homotopy to a contour over which the integral can be computed easily. So this makes the computation of integrals in many cases far easier. We will now state a variant of the Cauchy's theorem. It essentially says the same. Let me just call it as Cauchy's theorem 2 and then we will see that it is uh, going to be equivalent to what we have just written down. Cauchy's theorem, the uh, variant states the following. Again, let omega be open and f be a function which is holomorphic on omega. Suppose gamma 0 from AB 
to omega is a rectifiable curve which is null homotopic. Recall that a curve is said to be null homotopic if it is homotopic as closed curves to the constant curve uh, based at the starting point of gamma 0. That means there is a homotopy from gamma 0 to gamma 1. Uh, gamma 1 is a map from a b into omega defined by gamma 1 of t is equal to z 0 for all t in a b and z 0 is such that it is the initial and uh, terminal point of gamma 0. So, suppose gamma 0 is a rectifiable curve which satisfies this condition, it is null homotopic, then the conclusion tells us that integral of f of z dz over gamma 0 is equal to 0. Let us compare the two variants of Cauchy's theorem. This tells us that if we have uh, two curves which are homotopic to each other, then the integral is preserved. Now, assume that uh, gamma 1 in the case above, say for example, in this case gamma 1 is the constant curve. We know that the integral of f over a constant curve is 0 and uh, by using the uh, part 2 of the uh, first version of Cauchy's theorem, we can immediately conclude that Cauchy's theorem 2 is satisfied because we know that this is equal to the integral over gamma 1 of f of z dz which is equal to 0 because gamma 1 is a constant curve. The more complicated or rather it is not complicated, the non-trivial part let me put it that way, it is to show that uh, the converse is true. So, maybe I should write down another proposition here, Cauchy's theorem. Two implies Cauchy's theorem. The other side we have already easily checked. So this is uh, the final step in the direction of establishing that the two variants that have been written above both are uh, equivalent. All right. So let's uh, try to prove the 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 variant uh, the part one here. I will leave the second part as an exercise for you. So, let gamma 0 and uh, gamma 1 uh, be curves which are homotopic with fixed endpoints. So, let me use without loss of generality the domain of definition of gamma 1 to be equal to a b itself because otherwise we could just reparameterize it and realize it as a curve on a b. The integral does not change when we do a reparameterization. So, we may as well start off with gamma 1 defined on a b such that gamma 0 is homotopic to gamma 1 as fixed endpoints. Then homotopic with fixed endpoints. And if you notice gamma 0 plus the reversal of gamma 1 by one of the exercises given in the previous lecture, this is homotopic to uh, gamma 1 plus minus of gamma 1. We have used actually more than one exercise from the previous lecture. The first one uh, is to say that it is indeed uh, reflexive minus gamma 1 is homotopic to minus gamma 1 itself and if gamma 0 is homotopic to gamma 1 and minus gamma 1 is homotopic to minus gamma 1, then gamma 0 is homo gamma 0 plus minus gamma 1 is homotopic to gamma 1 plus minus gamma 1 with fixed endpoints of course. And by using one more property from the previous lectures, gamma previous lecture, gamma 1 plus minus gamma 1 is homotopic to the constant path, which let me call it as gamma 2 with fixed endpoints, where gamma 2 of any point T is just the point z0 which is the same as gamma 0 of a. And now let us use the Cauchy's theorem, the second 
uh, variant of Cauchy's theorem, which helps us conclude that uh, integral of f over any closed rectifiable curve is zero if the curve is null homotopic. We have just established that the curve gamma one plus minus gamma gamma zero plus minus gamma one is homotopic to a constant path and hence null homotopic by Cauchy's theorem two. We have integral of f of z dz over gamma 0 plus minus of gamma 1 is equal to 0. And I will just leave it to you. I think we have done enough of these manipulations to con conclude that this is the same as demanding that this is if and only if f of z dz over gamma 0 is equal to integral of f of z dz over gamma 1. A very similar proof can be used to uh, conclude the second part of the Cauchy's theorem which we stated initially. So these two statements therefore are logically equivalent. In both these cases though one thing to keep in mind is that we have demanded our function f to be holomorphic on the entire open set omega. We are not, we are not restricting our attention to uh, how f is defined in a neighborhood of gamma 0 and gamma 1 even though we are only considering the integral of uh, f along gamma 0 or gamma 1, we are still demanding that our function f here is holomorphic on the entire space omega. So, this can be explained by, uh, by observing that the curves gamma 0 and gamma 1 are homotopic to each other and for uh, homotopy to exist between gamma 0 and gamma 1, our domain omega should be sufficiently large. And our function f should also be holomorphic on such a sufficiently large domain. So, that is uh, an idea which uh, is best illustrated by the following example or rather non-example. If you look at the function f of z is equal to 1 by z, that is a function which is defined on omega given by c minus 0. So, our domain here is c minus 0 and consider our curve gamma of t to be equal to e to the power i t for t belonging to 0 comma 2 pi. Suppose we have our curve defined on this particular interval. Then we have already checked that the integral of f of z dz over gamma this is equal to 2 pi i times i. So, we have a closed rectifiable curve on which the integral of f is not equal to 0. Cauchy's theorem would demand that uh, such a curve be, uh, be okay, such a curve not be null homotopic because if gamma was null homotopic, if it was homotoped to a point, then Cauchy's theorem would have forced this to be 0. So, gamma uh, is not a curve which can be homotoped to a point. The reason is quite straightforward. We have the origin here in the uh, complex plane where our function f is not holomorphic and therefore the origin does not belong to the domain of definition and the uh, the, the absence of origin uh, ensures that our curve gamma cannot be homotopic to a point. So, this in particular illustrates that the property of f being holomorphic on the space omega the global nature of uh, such a demand is requisite for the conclusion of uh, uh, Cauchy's theorem here. Okay, let us get down to proving Cauchy's theorem. As a first step, we will be proving Cauchy's theorem on a special case. The case when our curve gamma is a triangle, it is a polygonal path consisting of three sides such that the, the convex hull is contained in our given domain omega. We will prove this. This is this version is called Gursa's theorem, and Gursa's theorem will be applied or used to prove the more general Cauchy's theorem. Let me state the uh, uh, Gursa's theorem, and we will then prove it. Suppose omega is a domain 
in C f from omega to C B holomorphic and z1 z2 z3 be three points in omega three points in omega such that uh, the convex hull of z1 z2 z3 is contained in omega that means that summation ai zi or a1 z1 plus a2 z2 plus a3 z3 belongs to omega whenever summation ai is less than or equal to one is contained in omega then consider the polygonal path consisting of straight lines joining z1 to z2 z2 to z3 and z3 to z1 if you consider this polygonal path f of z dz is equal to 0 so why is this being treated as a special case of cauchy's theorem because the fact that z1 z2 z3 are points whose convex hull is contained in omega effectively tells us that the curve gamma z1 z2 z1 to z2 to z3 to z1 that is a null homotopic curve and we are demanding that the, the second variant which was written above which was logically equivalent to the first variant that we wrote that will be uh, satisfied by this particular statement. So we are doing it for very special curves and that is why it was mentioned that uh, a special case of Cauchy's theorem is being proved. So let me give a proof of the Gursa's theorem. We will prove it first by image, uh, drawing an image of uh, the setup we are in. So we are in a domain, again not be this good a domain, but we certainly have a triangle of this type, this is z0, z1 or maybe z1, z2, z3, that's what is used, z1, z2 and z3, such that the convex hull is also, this is the convex hull if you notice. This is also contained in our given domain omega. And the curve gamma is the straight line path z1 to z2 concatenated with z2 to z3 which is then concatenated with z3 to z1. Let us do one thing, let us give the curve a compact notation, let us denote the curve gamma z0 to z1 to z2 to z3 to z1 this curve by t0 let us denote this curve by t0 we will prove that uh, we will prove this theorem by contradiction we will prove that if this integral is not equal to 0 we will come to some contradiction what does it mean to say that the integral is not equal to 0 Suppose integral of f of z dz over t0, this is not 0, that means the absolute value will be greater than some epsilon for uh, some epsilon positive. Now let us come back to our image here. Let us give some names to the midpoints. Let the midpoint here be z12. Let the midpoint here be z23 and the midpoint here be z31. And let us join these lines. So I kind of threw out the orientation. This was the orientation of the curves. Right. So The orientation here would be like this. So notice that the integral of f over gamma, which is the polygonal path joining z1, z2, z3, if we somehow bring in z12, z23, and z31, we can split the integral and after uh, 
some calculations we can conclude the following then integral of f over f integral of f of z over dz over t0 this is equal to the integral over gamma 1 of f of z dz plus integral over gamma 2 over gamma 3 and over gamma 4. So, what are these gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3 and gamma 4? So, this is gamma 1, this is gamma 2, this is gamma 3 and this is gamma 4. Notice that there will be cancellations of these uh, triangle to get back integral of uh, f over t0. Let me write down what gamma 1 is, where gamma 1 is the curve z1 to z12 to to z23 or z31, z31 to z1 gamma 2 is gamma z2 to z23 to z12 to z2 gamma 3 is the curve gamma z3 to z31 to z23 to z3 and gamma 4 this is just gamma z12 to z23 to z31 to z12 we have captured the four triangles and uh, by noting that there will be cancellations on the red on the sides of the red triangle we will be able to conclude that the integral of f over t0 is the same as this as the same uh, as the thing on the right and by triangle inequality we have this is the same as this which is less than or equal to the absolute value of the individual. So, let me just write that down integral of f of z dz over t0 absolute value this is less than or equal to integral over gamma 1 of f of z dz absolute value plus dot 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 plus absolute value of integral of f of z dz over gamma 4. But we also know or rather we have assumed that integral of f over uh, t0 that is uh, greater than or equal to an epsilon positive and hence there exists a curve hence uh, there exists one of gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3 and gamma 4 one of those four which will denote by uh, t1. such that integral of f of z dz over t1 the absolute value is greater than or equal to epsilon by 4. So, let me just go up and uh, show you what is being written here. There are four terms which are featuring in here. The sum of these four terms is greater than or equal to epsilon. All are positive. So, at least one of them is necessarily greater than or equal to epsilon by 4 that is what is being uh, said here. That is forced because if all of them are less than epsilon by 4 their sum would also be less than epsilon by 4 and this would be contradictory. So, one of them will certainly be greater than or equal to epsilon by 4. It does not matter which one let us pick one of them one of gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, gamma 4. So, it is going to be one of these four triangles that are drawn here which will be uh, denoted by t1 and which satisfies the condition that integral of f over t1 is greater than or equal to epsilon by 4. The thing to note here is that the diameter note that oh, before I come to the diameter the arc length of t1 this is just going to be equal to arc length of t0 by 2 and also the diameter of t1 Diameter of T1 is just the supremum of mod of Z minus W where Z comma W belongs to 
T1 or the image of T1 rather. This is going to be equal to the diameter of T0 by 2 again. So, remember that this is the supremum of uh, absolute value of z minus w where z comma w belongs to the uh, belongs to t1 let me just put it that way this means that it is in the image of t1 t1 is a curve after all right so it's the supremum of uh, the differences there. and that's always going to be uh, that will be less than or equal to or in fact here it will be equal to the diameter of t0 by 2 you should sit down and check both these statements here now we will do an exact same procedure on t1 as well by repeating the process above i will not write it down in detail process above we get t0 t1 t2 so on such that the integral of f of z dz over t n this is greater than or equal to epsilon by 4 to the power n so at every stage it is going to be greater than epsilon by 4 and therefore at the nth stage uh, 1 by 4 term is being multiplied at every stage so this is going to be greater than or equal to epsilon by 4 to the power n okay we are in good shape as of now because uh, if you notice diameter of t n this is just going to be equal to diameter of t0 by 2 to the power n which converges to 0 as n goes to infinity. So pick some zn, oh, in fact notice that uh, we can say more here, we can say that diameter of t1 hat is equal to diameter of t0 hat by 2 where t1 hat is the convex hull of t1. and t0 hat is the convex hull of t0. So, let us just go up to the figure and again look at what uh, the convex hull of t0 will be. The convex hull of t0 is going to be this entire space inside the bigger triangle and the convex hull of t1 will be the entire space inside the smaller triangle and uh, the convex hull of t 0 as you can see contains the convex hull of t1. It can be checked uh, rigorously by writing down the details and uh, at every stage we can say the, the same thing here. We can say that the diameter of tn is equal to diameter of tn hat rather is equal to diameter of tn minus 1 hat by 2 which inductively will hence be equal to diameter of t0 hat by 2 to the power diameter of t0 hat is a constant value and this converges to 0. Now pick some zn which belongs to tn hat and notice that this uh, sequence and by star. So, this is by, by the previous observation let me not call it anything. By the previous observation the sequence zn turns out to be a Cauchy sequence because remember that the uh, the convex hull T n hat is sitting inside the convex hull T n minus 1 hat. So, it is a, a decreasing sequence of uh, sets and therefore, this is certainly a Cauchy sequence which has a limit because of completeness of omega by completeness z n converges to some point let us call it z 0. Z 0 will be uh, certainly in each of the Tn's, in particular it is going to be in the intersection of Tn's, so, hence it is going to be in omega. So, no problem there and uh, because Z0 is in omega, we know that our function f is holomorphic at Z0. Till now if you notice, we have not used uh, any of the holomorphicity properties of f. We have just been using the fact that uh, there are some nice properties of the integrals which can be used to uh, concentrate our integral onto smaller and smaller places and give bounds on that. So, remember that this is the bound we have always had till now. Now, on the point z0, let us use the fact that f is holomorphic, complex differentiable. Since f is complex differentiable on omega, since 
SS complex differentiable in particular at Z0 at Z0 given epsilon positive there exists a delta positive given epsilon prime positive we have already taken epsilon given epsilon prime positive there exists a delta positive such that the absolute value of f of z minus f of z0 this minus f prime at z0 times z minus z0 this is less than epsilon prime times z minus z0 this is by just uh, clearing out the denominators in the in the newtonian quotients whenever absolute value of z minus z0 is less than delta this is something which we can certainly say from the complex differentiability of f at z0 and uh, notice that for large n for large n because the diameter of tn is uh, converging down to 0 and z0 is in each of these tns tn hat is contained in dz0 delta and therefore hence mod of z minus z0 this is going to be less than the diameter of tn which is equal to the diameter of t0 by 2 to the power n notice that this is all uh, possible because tn hat is contained in the uh, ball of radius delta around disk of radius delta around z0 okay so what do we have hence i e the absolute value of f of z minus f of z0 minus f prime at z0 times z minus z0 this is less than epsilon prime times the diameter of t0 by 2 to the power n so in particular if we are to consider the absolute value of the integral of f of z minus so let me uh, split it and write it down carefully this is f of z0 plus f prime at z0 times z minus z0 this this absolute value the integral is for the entire thing dz this is less than or equal to the bound epsilon prime into diameter of t0 by 2 to the power n times the r length so, so over tn is going to be bounded by the r length of tn and we know precisely what this is this is exactly equal to epsilon prime into the arc length of t0 into the diameter of t0 by 4 to the power n by the previous one of the previous observations i have already noted that the arc length also goes down by half at every stage so here parallelly we could also note that the arc length of tn is arc length of t0 by 2 to the power n because arc length of tn is equal to arc length of t n minus 1 by 2 to, uh, by 2 yeah so inductively we get hold of this but then what is the thing inside the absolute value that we have written here the absolute value splits up or rather the integral splits up this is going to be integral over tn of f of z dz minus the integral over tn of f of z0 plus f prime at z0 times z minus z0 this is exactly what is uh, this thing inside the this thing inside the absolute value and i will leave it to you to sit down and check that this integral vanish the clue is to use the first fundamental theorem of calculus and the fact that whatever is being integrated has an explicit antiderivative and that tn is a closed curve. So by the first fundamental theorem of calculus the first term vanishes and hence we get to conclude that 
the integral of f of z dz over t n the absolute value is less than or equal to maybe less than epsilon prime times the arc length of t0 into diameter of t0 at by 4 to the power n. So, if we had picked epsilon prime large enough or rather small enough so that epsilon prime times the arc length of t0 times the diameter of t0 hat is less than epsilon, then we can conclude then for epsilon prime small enough, we have the absolute value of f of z dz integral over tn this is less than epsilon by 4 to the power n. But how did we pick our tns? Let us go up and check how we had picked our tns. Tns were inductively picked so that at every stage it is less than or rather it is greater than epsilon by 4 to the power n. This is how t1 was picked and by repeating the integral uh, the inductive process there we had picked tn in such a manner that integral of f of z dz over tn has absolute value greater than or equal to epsilon by 4 to the power n. So, let us call this star and we have just concluded that for n large we can ensure that this is less than epsilon by 4 to the power n which is a contradiction to star. So, if we start with the assumption that uh, our function f has an integral over t0 greater than or equal to epsilon for some epsilon positive, then we are arriving at some kind of a contradiction. And that means that our assumption has to be false. Thus, integral of f of z dz over t0, this is less than epsilon for all epsilon positive. In particular, this tells us that the integral of the absolute value and this in particular tells us that the absolute value is equal to 0 and hence the integral itself is equal to 0 and that is precisely what we had set out before. This is an unusual proof by contradiction which is not expected at first sight. So, one thing to keep in mind is that the argument we have given here did not use uh, anything more than the differentiability of f at the point z0. Of course, z0 was arbitrary and therefore, we do need that uh, it could be uh, any point in the domain, but we do not certainly demand that the function f is continuously differentiable. So, that is something which you should keep in mind because most of the results that we uh, proved earlier, we did use somehow or the other the fact that or the requirement that f be continuously differentiable. Here, we did not use that. Let me conclude this lecture by giving a proof of the uh, Cauchy's theorem on a very special case. We will prove the more general case in the next lecture. Here we will prove that if our curve gamma is uh, polygonal and such that uh, its convex hull is contained in the given domain. So, let us start with a convex domain for example and if you consider any polygonal closed polygonal path in the integral of a holomorphic function f over the polygonal path is 0. So, let me write it down Cauchy's theorem. for polygonal paths. So, let omega uh, be a convex domain and uh, gamma z0 to z1 to all the way up to say we will start with z1, z, z1 itself. to Zn to Z1 be a closed polygonal path. Notice that this ensures that the convex hull is also contained in 
our given domain omega because the uh, domain omega is convex. And suppose f is a function defined on omega which is holomorphic. Then integral of f of z dz over the closed polygonal path Oh, this is not Zn, this is Z1. This is equal to 0. Let us give a proof of this. The proof is by induction. So, let me just draw a picture for you so that the setup is clear. We have some domain and we have a point Z1 to Z2 to Z3 right. So, this is Z1, Z2 and so on. This is going to be Zn minus 1, this is Zn and then finally back to Z1. This is our setup and because it is, oh this is a convex domain. So, I should not be drawing it like this. Let me be more careful. This is something like this, let us say. This is, this is our domain omega, the interior of it. And our domain is, uh, our curve is like this. We will prove it by induction. The proof is by induction. Well, n equal to uh, 1 case, there is nothing to prove. It is just going to be a point. The polygonal path is just going to be a point. When n is equal to 2, yet again it is going to be gamma z1 to uh, z2, but then it has to get back, it is a closed part. So, z2 should necessarily hence be equal to z1. And because it is a straight line, it is just going to be again a constant part. So, when n is equal to 1 and n is equal to 2, we are just looking at the integral of f over a constant curve. And there is nothing to prove that it is already known to be equal to 0. For n equal to 3, Gusa's theorem we just proved establishes this. Tells us that integral of f of z dz over gamma is equal to 0, where gamma is the polygonal part, closed polygonal part. We will now put the induction hypothesis. Assume that the result. is proved for up to n minus 1 and let us get back to our result here. Suppose we have this as our setup and let us draw the straight line path joining z1 to z n minus 1 and uh, by using the usual properties of uh, the integral over polygonal path. So, I have all through I have used this crucially that integral of gamma z1 to z2 to z2 to z3 to z3 to z1 that polygonal path it is a polygonal path is a concatenation of straight lines. So, we can split it up and write it as the sum of the integral over these straight lines that has been used crucially all along we will use that yet again. We will use that to conclude here. Then integral of f over gamma z1 to z2 to zn to z1 this is equal to the integral of gamma z1 to z2 to zn minus 1 to z1. So, let us go up and see what we did. We went along these curves and then we went along zn minus 1 to zn. That is what we did. That is the curve ca being captured here. And then one more curve in the story would be gamma zn minus 1 to zn to z1 to zn minus 1. So, basically z n minus 1 to z n, z n minus 1 to z n to z 1 and back to z n minus 1. 
right that's what is being captured here right of f of z dz the integral along the line zn minus 1 to z1 is cancelled off each other by the straight lines appearing here and the straight lines appearing here just like it had done in the uh, previous case okay now we are again good to go because by induction hypothesis this vanishes by induction hypothesis and this is going to vanish by gursas theorem because here the convex hull is going to be inside our given domain omega because omega is a convex set. This is by Gursa and this is by induction hypothesis. Both vanish and we get to conclude that and the integral of f over gamma z1 all the way up to zn to z1 this is equal to 0 and that is precisely what we had set out to prove. In the next lecture we will be proving the Cauchy's theorem in the manner we had stated in the beginning of this lecture.